are a Saints fan, why would you not be subscribing to NewOrleans.Football? The, the ideas that Nick will give you, the insight that he will give you, like everybody's trying to break down the cap. Everybody uses Nick Underhill to break down the cap for a reason. Go check out New Orleans on Football Saints fans. You will not be disappointed when you sign up. Nick, what's going on, man? Thanks for joining us. I don't know who this uh, Barrett fellow is, but you're number one to me, man. So hey, you, hey. You, you can say that. Thank you. On the Nick Underhill uh, National <laughs> Mid-Market Local Morning Sports Talk Show list, we are number one, not to brag, on the New Orleans uh, football list. Uh, well, you are number one on my list when it comes to Saints, Nick, and um, on the most recent New Orleans article, or one of the most recent articles on the site, um, you were asking the very question that we've been trying to parse through on this show, which is that with Matt Stafford now out of the equation, uh, what does that inform us on this Saints quarterback search? So I'm going to leave this open-ended. Stafford's out. Where where do you think the Saints stand, the Saints stand now? Yeah, I think, first of all, that maybe we were a little bit higher than Matthew Stafford than they were. It doesn't sound like there was really any effort there or any interest there to, to go and get him. And it is kind of interesting. Like, the Aryan season, I think, kind of uh, clouds the way we talk about Jameis Winston because it was really bad. He turned the ball over 45 times with the fumbles and the interceptions. You go back a year, and you kind of start looking at it, though, and you, if you look at that Aryan season as an outlier, maybe there isn't as big of a difference between Matthew Stafford and Jameis Winston. And I know everybody likes to say, well, Stafford's in this terrible situation and da 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 And I think that there is some truth to that, and there is some circumstances surrounding that. But he has played with some really good players, Calvin Johnson, Marvin Jones, Kenny Galladay, um, you know, and, and some other guys, Hawkinson. He, he's had good weapons around him, and his numbers – compared to Jameis through four years really aren't that much different. And if you can have, you know, Jameis Winston without the interceptions compared to Matthew Stafford, it's not that big of a gap. And if you start talking about the compensation, you know, is it worth it to go that, that direction? And I think that's the thing that they kind of had to ask themselves since word came out that Stafford was going to be available. And, you know, my understanding is that they really would like to have Jameis Winston back. They really liked the work he did this year, but I do think they're going to set a price. And if somebody decides that Jameis is worth more to them than what the Saints think, they'll let him go. And that's kind of how they've negotiated forever. Uh, you know, there's, there's just that walk away point. And there is that with Jameis. It's not, you know, do or die. He has to be the guy. I just think that they would like to have him back. They think he could do good. And, you know, if there's a rookie or something, they'll, they'll look at a draft pick or, if Jameis goes on, you start looking at the other guys out there and maybe that, you know, puts you back at Taysom Hill or you look at Jacoby Brissett or, or somebody else. But, um, you know, you, you start talking about the other names behind Winston that could be available. And I think getting Jameis back in becomes a little bit uh, more important because you could quickly enter some scary territory. And, you know, that's why we've talked forever about them drafting a quarterback every year and everybody's like, oh, you got to get the guy around Breeze. You got to help Breeze now. Well, this is the point you get to it and it's pretty uncertain and it can be scary, but I do think that they have a, an option they like in Jameis Winston. Okay. So I have about a million different directions that I want to go here. Um, but I think I want to, okay, I'm just going to start here real quick. We don't have to belabor this point. Uh, do you think there's a market for Jameis? And like, do you have any idea what that number is? the Saints be willing to go to? Like, will there be other teams that come in and drive Jameis Winston out of the Saints range? I don't know what the market would be for him. I mean, he, he just signed for a million dollars, and I don't know what would have happened between then and now to make that number go up significantly. Although I, I think that was – it's just ridiculous that, that he was able to be acquired for that price. I, I don't really understand it. I know that season was bad, but, he, I mean, he's a 25-year-old guy with all the skills in the world, and – these other players, you know, that they get signed and they get chances. And there's guys out there on teams that, that are paid more and I think considerably worse than Jameis without the same upside. And it just seemed like nobody really wanted to give him that, that chance. So I don't know if, if being here and getting the Sean Payton magic sprinkled on him somehow makes someone, you know, want to find out what's behind the door and outbid him. But I think the advantage that the Saints have is that they can go to a price and they know what they're bidding on. And I don't think anybody else really knows what, what they're bidding on. All they seen is the Aryan season and then two drives where Winston came in in uh, relief for Breeze or, or a quarter and a half, whatever it was. But I don't know how you could how you could value him 
significantly higher, but there could be somebody waiting in the weeds. But I mean, there are other quarterbacks available. You know, there's some guys that I think other teams might target before him, but the, the wild card here, or the advantage rather is, is that they do know. So, you know, I don't know what the number is. I, I mean, that's the problem. That's the problem with this whole conversation is that we don't have the information on James and it's, it's impossible to evaluate him, yeah. but other teams have that issue. So it's just, you gotta, you gotta trust the saints here, I guess. And you know, that that's probably easier said than done. But I think the thing that I take, when I look at how Taysom played, compared to how he played at BYU, there is significant growth there. He looks like a different quarterback. Was it good enough to be a starter? You know, I I don't know. I'm not convinced of that. But when I look at how he played at BYU compared to how he pocket passed for the Saints in those games, there is a significant amount of growth. Now, if you give Sean a player with with a very high-end set of skills and, and limitless talent, and if he takes to the coaching the same way that Taysom did, what's that growth process? So, you know, for me, that's, this is kind of where, how I'm trying to approach it is that I, I do trust their ability to develop a quarterback. I remain skeptical to some degree, but, you know, you just kind of got to fly blind and, and assume that they know what they're doing here. So real quick on Taysom, what is the kind of current status of Taysom Hill in that building? Because uh, it, it's just interesting, the public conversation, it's almost like he is like, in a way, kind of left out now, where it's like, okay, it feels like it's Jameis now, and then if it's not Jameis, or there's other names that you can bring in, has as is it the turn? Like, have people just turned the page on him being the starter next year? I know, I think they still like him. You know, the things I hear about him are, are still positive. You know, I, I just think that we all probably saw those games, and, and he's fine. Like, if you had to, if you had to run a season back with him, you know, I think I said on here before, I think they could win ten games with him if, if they kept the structure around him. But I don't think you're gonna ever win a game because of him. It's, it's just it just didn't seem like it was there. I mean, maybe there's there's still room for growth. You know, I, I don't know if we look at him like he's a guy approaching thirty or a guy that could be going into you know his first season ever as a starting quarterback. And it's just it's just hard to figure out where the the level of growth is. You know, if if Taysom would have been able to to run and extend plays and, and and tap into the skills that made him special, while also managing the offense from the pocket, you know, I think it's a much different conversation how we look at him, but we just didn't see those other skills married with the, with the, uh, the pocket passing. So, you know, I, I, I think as we have these conversations, it might not necessarily be the same as theirs. Um, but I think, you know, the way we talk about it, we, we saw four games, he didn't convince anybody. So you got to look at something better. And, you know, I, I think they do this, the same thing. Like when they scout any position, they take their guy, they scout him, they compare him to somebody else, and they decide is, is there improvement or not. And that's how they found Marquez Callaway. Like, they're set at returner. They're still scouting returners. Yeah. And, and they find him and, and decide he can come in because they were comparing him to Deontay. So I think it's the same process taking place. I think they would probably settle on, on Taysom, but I think you do have to try to find ways to get better at that position. Do you know, Nick, if, they, uh, if you were to extrapolate Taysom Hill's turnovers from last year into a full season of starting – would he beat Jameis Winston? Like, would he exceed Jameis Winston's Bruce Arians year? How many fumbles did he have last year? I mean, at, at one point, it felt like the fumble rate was at like 5% or something absurd. Where it was like one out of 10 every 20. I don't know. Just a little food for thought. Because I know you're like uh, Russell Crowe, beautiful mind um, type of researcher and math guy. And I know you've just got like your entire home is covered in yards of string connecting all these different <laughs> dots. So just a little food for thought, something for New Orleans up football. Um, what about this? And we'll end on this. Does – okay, so you mentioned potentially getting into scary territory, right, if you got to get past Jameis and then maybe even past Taysom, or like maybe what comes next after that. Um, does the eventual quarterback they land on affect their goals as a whole? Like – if you don't get a caliber quarterback that maybe you were looking for, then do you swallow some more of this short-term debt and maybe uh, not try to remain as competitive in the short term? The thing, the thing about that is, that, like, what's the point of rebuilding? Like, if you have the, these young players that are good and you got to pay them, if you tear it down in three years, you're just going out and you're trying to find Ryan Ramchek, Marshawn Lattimore. That's a great point. Mike Thomas, everybody else, and you put them around them. So it's just now you're overpaying for free agents because you don't have guys on your roster because you found a cheap quarterback. When you can just keep that intact and put somebody in and, and you know, try to try to win games, you know, 
you kind of get stuck in purgatory if it doesn't work out well enough and, and you could become a team like, you know, the Colts that are just kind of competing to get into the playoffs. And if they win a game, you feel like it's, it's a huge success, but you know, maybe they get lucky and they get their Tom Brady, you know, this off season or next off season. And now the Colts are, are a team that are good enough to get in the Super Bowl. And I, I think the Saints are, are right there too. They drafted and built this great core. I think you're always better off playing, paying your own players and going out into the open market. So no, I, I don't think I'd do that. I, I, I don't think it's a quarterback dependent decision. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's going to be super bad this year. I, I do think next year's the year if the cap stays where it's at is when things start to get a little bit scary because you just keep pushing. And then if there's no elevation, you know, at some point it, it gets hard to find things to keep pushing. But, you know, for now, I, I think the best bet, regardless, independent of the quarterback, is to keep it together and try to, you know, remain a good team. It's a great logic right there, and that's what you will find throughout New Orleans Top Football. Great logic, incredible insight, incredible connections. So if you're a Saints fan, uh, it is definitely worth it. Go to New Orleans Top Football today, sign up. Nick, thank you so much, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks, man. All right. Uh, Greg Lamont saying, Taysom had two interceptions over the four games he started and three fumbles over that same time period as well. But I'm talking about, see, I'm talking about a play-to-turnover ratio. You find that, and then you find the average number of plays that a starting quarterback plays, or just do the number of plays that James Winston played in his Bruce Arians year and see who would have ended with more turnovers. i got to be saying that at least. Uh, or i got to be thinking that Taysom Mill actually probably ends with more. Maybe we can figure it out on the break. Um, all right, do we get back? Maybe we'll talk about Karen versus LeBron. We'll see. Close out the show here on OTBO2. Listen.